When I first preached here in 1967, in January, I noticed on the bulletin, message, not sermon, but message. And uh, I believe that when one preaches, one ought to deliver a message. And the preacher has to remember that there will be people in the congregation who will have special needs. And I've tossed about, about a number of things I should talk about. And what really came to me came alive yesterday. And I don't type, so I can't um, type at 100 words a minute. And uh, now I am at the stage when I have senior moments. So I may have a few senior moments. And um, therefore, what I'm about to tell you is something that came alive to me yesterday. And uh, I should really, at this stage, be reading my sermon. Well, I don't have a script, so I'm just going to talk to you. And if I have a senior moment, You'll help me out, maybe. Well, I've been asked to speak this morning about the future of Calvary Church. Looking into the future, a celebration. I was told afterwards what I was supposed to do, and that is that I was supposed to tell the church what they are to do in the future. Well, I'm a dinosaur, and really, I shouldn't be talking about the future. But I can do something better than that, and that is to remind myself as a member of the church and to the congregation as a whole what plan the Lord Jesus has for this church. In Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 16, the Lord Jesus said, I will build my church. The Lord Jesus did not come into the world merely to bring solitary believers into the faith. He came into the world to establish a church, a community, which is the community of Jesus Christ, through whom God is to bless the world. And he made this statement, I will build my church. And then after his resurrection, before he ascended to heaven, He told his disciples, the first mission team, the plan for the building of his church among all nations. And that plan is a long-term plan. For the Lord Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. So what the Lord said to the disciples in his appearance to them in Galilee before he finally ascended to heaven applies to the church of all ages and therefore it applies to us. The Lord gave what we call the Great Commission, the way in which Jesus builds his church in the world. And that Great Commission is to be found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. At verses, I'll read the context from verse 16 of chapter 28 of Matthew's Gospel. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, They worshipped him, 
but some doubted. He was then in his glorified body. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the plan that the Lord gave for the building of his church. And it is a plan that has proved to be very successful. On the eve of the birth of the church, and the church was born on the day of Pentecost, on the eve of the birth of the church, there were a hundred and twenty by way of a nucleus. But today, there are two and a half billion professing Christians in the world. As the Lord Jesus said, his church would grow like a mustard seed with a tiny beginning, but a marvelous ending, and the Church of Jesus Christ today is established in almost every country in the world. There may be just two or three countries where the Church of Jesus Christ is not established. And what we have in this Great Commission is the plan of the Lord Jesus, and we may say that this plan has two parts to it. First, there is the basis of the program, and then there are the commands which are attached to the program. The basis of the program is Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus, ultimately, it's all about Jesus. And who is Jesus? He says to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus Christ during his earthly life had all authority over everything in the world at that time. He had power over the forces of nature. He was able to still the storm on the lake in Galilee, able to turn water into wine, able to feed 5,000 beside women and children, so we may say 20,000 with a boy's lunch. He had power over diseases. Wherever he went, he healed the sick. He had the power over evil spirits. He cast out seven demons from Mary Magdalene. He had power over death. The ultimate, the last enemy, he had power. He raised the son of the daughter, of the son of the woman, the widow of Nain, they were on the way to the cemetery and Jesus stopped the funeral procession and said to the boy who was dead, get up. And he got up and he brought back from the dead Jairus', Jairus daughter. Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days and Jesus called, Lazarus, come out. And he came out. He had authority over forgiveness. He was able to forgive people and to impart to people the sense of forgiveness, filling their hearts with tremendous joy. He had authority over every power 
in this world. And after his resurrection, after he as God's right hand, which is of supreme power, and Jesus Christ became Lord of the universe. Lord over angels and all the good powers in the supernatural world and Lord over the devil and his demons and all the cosmic powers of wickedness are sovereign to him. He is Lord of all. We sing some very lovely hymns, new ones, but there's one in the New Testament that I would love to see a congregation sing. And here is one of the hymns that was sung in the early church. You'll find it in Philippians chapter 2, where we read, Christ Jesus, who is he? Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, listen to this, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. All the intelligences on planet earth and all the intelligences in the universe, every tongue will acknowledge in grace or in judgment that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is who he is. The one who, though he was God throughout eternity, took upon himself a human form and became perfect man and perfect God and was obedient to God's plan of salvation, even to the point of dying upon the cross. And as a result of that, God has exalted him to be Lord of the universe. So we're not talking about a prophet like Muhammad. We are talking about the Lord of the universe, to whom all authority is given. And Jesus says, therefore, in the light of who I am, he gives commands. And the first command he gives to his disciples is, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now, this word disciple can be misleading because Jesus had his disciples during his earthly life. They were 12 men and others who followed the rabbi and who came to believe that he was the Son of God and the Messiah. But they didn't have a clue as to what kind of Messiah he was going to be. Jesus tried to tell them about his death, that he must die and rise again. But Peter said, no, Lord. And the disciples refused to listen to Jesus is telling them what the plan was, that he was to die to bear the sins of the world and he was to rise again. No, no, no. And that is why 
They were so devastated when the cross happened. This was not in their thoughts, whatever. It was a devastating experience, whereas if they had believed what Jesus had taught them, they would have known why he was dying and why he rose again. And it was only after his resurrection that the disciples came to understand the gospel. And Jesus ascended to heaven after his resurrection. And he came back intermittently for 40 days to prepare his disciples to preach the gospel, to understand the gospel. And you may remember that on the afternoon of his resurrection that Jesus talked to the disciples on the Emmaus Road and he said to them, why are you crying? And they said, well, all hope is gone. We thought that Jesus was the Messiah, but he isn't. And Jesus then took the scriptures and said to them, look, what the scriptures say about the Messiah. And he showed them the passages that speak about him as the suffering servant, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The Lord has laid on him, the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. And he had to teach the gospel to them during those 40 years 40 days after his resurrection and before he finally ascended to heaven. So we're not talking about making disciples in the sense of following a rabbi. We're talking about making disciples in the sense of being devoted to the one who died for our sin and rose again. So better than make disciples. Let's use the expression, make Christians. The disciples were now to make Christians. And how do you make Christians? Well, people come to be Christians in many ways. And if we were to open this meeting for testimonies this morning, it would be very interesting to see how you became a Christian. But there is something which is basic. A disciple is a learner. And in the King James Version, you will notice that what it says is, go and teach all nations. There is something that people have to know before they become Christians. And that has to be taught. Faith comes by hearing, by hearing God's plan of salvation and the good news. And that is, in several passages of Scripture, summarized. The Apostle Paul in Corinthians summarizes. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, this is how you were saved, because you came to believe that Christ died according to the scriptures. He died as your sin bearer, and that he was raised, which doesn't mean simply he rose from the dead, but that he is alive. And again, In 1 Timothy, Peter says, this is a trustworthy saying, and everybody should accept it. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And you'll find summaries as to how people become Christians. What is the basic message of salvation? Paul, in Romans chapter 3 gives a summary. He says, The entire world is guilty before God. 
no one can ever be put right with God by doing what the law says. But now, God has shown us a way to be right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. We're all sinners, every one of us. How then can we be saved? We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes. Whoever you are, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, in his kindness, totally undeserved, declares that we are righteous. We sinners are deemed and declared to be righteous before God. He did it through Jesus Christ when he suffered and freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for our sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Simple message. Very simple. We are utterly guilty before God and we are subject to condemnation. We are responsible people and the day of judgment is coming. And when we stand before God, we would be utterly condemned. And God has taken steps so that his son, who perfectly kept the law of God, took our place. And the punishment that we deserve, he bore in our stead. And through him, God forgives us. God, as a just God, cannot acquit sin. The scripture says that very clearly. But he can forgive sin on a righteous basis. And the righteous basis is that another paid the debt for us. Another satisfied the justice of God. And because of what Jesus did for us, and we accept what he did for us, for the penalty, the punishment of our sin, we are forgiven and accepted as righteous before God. That's the message. Simple message. But, and it means nothing to a person who has never been convicted of his sin. Seems irrelevant. Jesus only becomes relevant to us at the point when we are convicted of our sin and take seriously the fact of the judgment that is to come. Only then. And this message, simple as it is, has transformed people. John 3.16, if you like, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Very simple, but it's transformed lives. Paul is very clear about this. It's very interesting to hear what he has to say when he went to Corinth. Corinth was a cesspool of wickedness. And when Paul went there, he admits that he was very nervous about preaching to a society like that. And he says, listen to this, when I first came to you in Corinth, dear brothers and sisters, he's talking to the Corinthian church, 
I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. For I decided, while I was with you, I would forget about everything except Christ, the one who was crucified. I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling, and my message and my preaching were plain. That's it. And yet it produced astonishing results. Later in the letter, he talks about the change that has taken place in the people who have come to believe that Jesus died to take away their punishment and to be their Savior and Lord. He says, he talks about the wickedness in, and the wicked people in Corinth. And after he's given a catalog of that wickedness, he says, some of you were like this, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God. One of the best books I've ever read was a, is a book by Ruth Tucker, and it's entitled From Jerusalem to Irian Jaya. And it's the story of missionary work. You know, the building of the Church of Jesus Christ worldwide is an astonishing event because this gospel has been taken to cannibals and all kinds of benighted people and produced incredible results. Arian Jaya, from Jerusalem to Arian Jaya, that is the centuries of Christian witness. And if you doubt whether this gospel is a powerful gospel, please read the account of the growth of the Church of Jesus Christ. John G. Payton went to the South Sea Islands and the people were cannibals. And he had a very, very difficult time. He was alone. His wife died, and his baby died. And he tells of how he dug the grave alone and, of course, conducted the service alone. And all these pagan people were gathered around, astonished and believing that's a very wicked foreigner and our gods are punishing him. And Peyton says, I would have died beside that lonely grave if it were not for Jesus and his presence. He's dead, he's alive. But those people, benighted as they were, they were gloriously saved. And when Peyton went back to Scotland on furlough, he told the story. And afterwards, a woman came to him and said, Mr. Peyton, I am so sorry for all the sacrifices you have had to make. And he turned to her and said, Sacrifice? Sacrifice? What sacrifice is there in seeing men and women delivered from the powers of darkness and discovering their dignity as the children of God? And speaking of Irian Jaya, if you were to ask one of our missionaries, Ed and his wife Marion, Ed said to me, Vandermeer, he said to me only the other day, you know, in Irian Jaya, they were cannibals. But there's, there's a church there now of people who rejoice in the Lord. And when you think of the Aukas and the story of the Aukas, Stone Age savages, gloriously saved. 
I met the pastor. And it was quite obvious. He couldn't speak my tongue. And I remember with Mr. G being in the, in the Amazon jungle at the source of the Amazon River. We were taken out there to see a tribe that Wycliffe Bible translators were working with. I couldn't speak a word to them, but we had one thing in common, and that was the joy of the Lord. That's true. And what we have to do is what this church has constantly done, is to preach the cross of Christ as the only place where people are reconciled with God and receive the forgiveness of sins and are born again of the Spirit. So that's how you make Christians. And don't try to make Christians any other way. Unfortunately, there are plenty of people in the churches who've never really understood maybe never really had a conviction of sin. I had a conviction of sin when I was 14, and I hadn't robbed a bank. As a matter of fact, my mother would have said I was a good boy because I was the eldest of the family, and I was the one who did things for her, and my dad would say I was the one who worked on the, worked on the allotment with him, and my school report was good. But at the age of 14... I experienced conviction of sin. And one Saturday night, three men prayed for me, and I've never looked back. Deep down, and I was, I've preached for 80, 80 years now, deep down there has been this marvelous assurance. Unworthy as I am, stumbling and frail as I am, Jesus died for me and on the basis of that one sacrifice for sin I'm accepted. That's the gospel. The essential gospel. And it's by the preaching of the gospel that people are made Christians. That's the first command. Go and preach the good news of the cross and the resurrection and the ascension. Preach Jesus and make believers. But in addition to that, there are three other commands. And as a matter of grammar, there are three participles, but they have imperative force. They're called, if you want a swanky word, concomitant imperatives. They go along. You're not saved this way. We are saved only by receiving God's gift of forgiveness in the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. But after that, it says, go. So it's not enough for us to preach. We must go. And that may mean going overseas as a full-time missionary. Or it may be going to our neighbors across the street. Go. Go to your fellows. Go to your friends. Go to your family. Go to your colleagues at work. Go and tell this marvelous news of the forgiveness of sins through the atoning death of the Lord Jesus. We must not stay in the holy huddle. We have to go out. This is good news. Incredible good news. And we mustn't keep it to ourselves. We must share it humbly, sensitively, but we must share it. That's our job. Then it says, baptize. When a person has received the Lord Jesus according to this program, he is to be baptized. Baptism effects nothing. It expresses 
much. It expresses the personal faith of the one being baptized. When a person is baptized, it depends on the church, he makes a confession of his faith in Jesus Christ. He may give his testimony, or he may answer the question, do you in your baptism wish to confess that you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, and your will to follow him? And the answer is, I do. It's a confession of personal allegiance and faith in Jesus Christ. What happened at the time of conversion? That is what is symbolized in baptism. And then the person officiating says, Upon your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Holy S- and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Very significant words. They describe what happens to a person in the time of his conversion, of his believing. He is in the name of This is now publicly declared in baptism in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That means in the ownership of. I remember when I was in high school, I bought my textbooks, as some of you did, secondhand. And when I bought it, the first thing I did was to scratch out the name of the man which had it before me, and put there, Gerald Griffiths, Form 4. It was mine. The book was under new ownership. And when you become a Christian, you're under new ownership. And that is a very, very exciting thing. When you think of a mama-papa store uh, on paper being taken over by Costco, My word, things are going to look up after that. (laughs) And we're under new ownership and all the resources of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit are ours. And that is declared in the Christian baptism. It's very meaningful. You may say everybody is a child of God. Yes, in the sense that they're created by God, but they're not the children of God in the sense that they have been forgiven and born again of his Spirit. It makes an enormous difference. We have an intimate relationship with God, our Father. Abba, that's how we pray. And Abba means Dad. Dear Father, we're in a very intimate relationship with Christ. When my little girl, now she's grown up, uh, was four, I heard her singing. I was in the kitchen, and uh, our staircase was in the hallway, and I was going to go to the hallway, And uh, here was this little girl sitting on the bottom step of the staircase, singing to herself. Her mum used to sing the children to sleep every night with choruses. And Mavanui had quite a repertoire of choruses. And she was enjoying herself all on her own, singing these choruses. And I heard, God is. And I knew what the chorus was supposed to be. God is still on the throne, and he will remember his own. But this little girl had her own version of it, and I heard her singing, God is still on the phone, (laughs) and he will remember his own. And she was right, of course because God is as near as the phone, and the line is never busy, and he will remember his own. 
You know, that's a fantastic thing. And in your own experience, to know that you can come to God in that way because you now are a justified, acceptable person before God. And Jesus Christ, we have access, we benefit from everything. All the benefits that were accomplished at Calvary and all the infinite resources of His, of Him, are ours. And Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me, and I give to them eternal life, and no one shall pluck them out of my hand, safe am I in the hollow of his hand and the Holy Spirit. In the midst of our darkness and our confusion, the Holy Spirit has been given to enlighten us and to guide us and to show us the way. We are rich, rich, rich people. And that is declared in our baptism. But baptism has another meaning. And that is, it is the entrance into the fellowship of the church. Baptism was never intended to be a standalone, where a person says, well, I've been baptized, but they don't go to church. Or if they go to church, it may be Easter and Christmas, or now and again. But that is not the teaching of Scripture. If you read, for instance, what is said in the Acts of the Apostles on the day of Pentecost, and this is what it says, that they put their faith in the Lord Jesus, and then they were baptized, and then they were added to the church. Listen. Many believed the message of Peter and were baptized, and about 3,000 people were added to the group. They spent their time, what? They'd been baptized. They were in the group, and they spent their time learning from the apostles, taking part in the fellowship, and sharing in the fellowship meals and the prayers. The Church of Jesus Christ is universal, and it is local. And the local churches are very important. And everyone who is baptized, according to the pattern here, should in that very act belong to a fellowship of believers. Whether you become a formal member is not the issue. But you have a family now, the people of God. And this church is very good at that. The prayer bulletin is second to none. The details of it, people who are prayed for. We belong to a people. As I say, Jesus did not come into the world to save lone wolfers. He came into the world to create a community of believers. And through that community of believers to reach the world to minister to the world. So, bring people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and bring people into the fellowship, to live in the fellowship of believers, the family of God, your brothers and sisters. And that's a wonderful experience to have that sense which God intends in his plan for the growth of his church. And finally, there is the command, teaching, teach. Every commandment, teach the believers to obey everything I have commanded you. Being a Christian is to have a new way of life. Actually, Christianity was called the way in the New Testament. It's a lifestyle. 
And that lifestyle is based upon the example and teaching of the Lord Jesus. How are we to live? We are to be Christ-like. And the business of the church is when people come into the fellowship and live in the fellowship, that together we help each other to become Christ-like people. That's what the church is intended to be, a fellowship of Christ-like people. I remember some years ago now, one of my grandsons was, I suppose, five, he may have been six, and he'd been to Daily Vacation Bible School here, and he had got uh, a, a wristband, and he refused to go home until he came to our house to show us his wristband. And on the wristband, there was WWJD. What would Jesus do? And we've got to start with the five-year-olds. That being a Christian means being like Jesus. And that's the big job that we have, is to become like the Lord Jesus, especially in our days, because we live now in a world where there are no absolute values and everything is relative. And people will say, well, going to church is your hobby. Mine is playing golf. It's just a matter of choice. But for that reason, it's very hard to witness to people, especially when you read things in the press about what priests have done and what this has done and the other. And you say, look at those Christians. Well, the whole question is that the day is going to come where we're going to stand individually before God and what other Christians have done. But it's a shame. People today will not read the Bible bound in book leather but they'll read it in boot leather. Your boot leather and my boot leather. The way in which we behave. And this has become more important than ever in the kind of society that we are living in where there are no absolute values. Revelation doesn't count. The only truth that is valid is what is scientifically confirmable. The whole question of revelation has gone out of the window. And now, what's left? Your life and my life. Some years ago, there was a professor, I'm going back over a hundred years, who taught Latin and Greek in Queen's University here in Kingston. And after that, he went back to Cambridge, where he was a fellow. And he became a professor of ancient history and wrote some very authoritative books on the ancient world. He was a Christian. And a hundred years ago, actually 1917, this book was published, The Jesus of History. And in this book, he accounts for, and remember, he was a professional historian, he accounts for the miracle that the tiny church of Jesus Christ conquered the pagan world. It's an astonishing story when you think of those 120 in the upper room. And the church of Jesus Christ conquered the pagan world. The spread of the gospel in that early period was amazing. As Tertullian said, we're only a people of yesterday, but we fill the whole world. How did they do it? And this professor gave three explanations as to why the Church of Jesus Christ was so effective in spreading the gospel. He said, the Christians outthought the pagans. And of course we do. We've got a world view. 
the humanistic, secular world has no worldview. There isn't a worldview. We used to sing a hymn, Life at best is very brief, like the falling of a leaf. And that's it. The, the leaves come out in their buds. And then there's the full leaf. And then comes the fall. And the sap drains out of the branches down the trunk and the leaves change colour and they fall. And I'm like a leaf that falls in the forest. That's what I am according to the worldview that is prevalent. It's a society of despair that we're living in. There's no future. But look at this story in this book. It starts in eternity and finishes in eternity. It starts with the beginning of time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it leads on to the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ to consummate God's purposes of salvation and beyond that to the new heavens and the new earth. Marvelous! We're on a journey with a marvelous destination. We outthink the pagans every time. We've got a great story to tell. And the pagans of that day were left behind. And they outlived the pagans because they weren't afraid of death. They were thrown to the lions. Their bodies were burnt and held up on the pole for a carnival for Nero. They weren't afraid of death. And that's a marvelous hope. The Church of Jesus Christ is the only society in the world that offers you a transfer in the moment of death. You are transferred, you've got a membership that serves you for time and eternity. And when you leave the church on earth, the church militant, you go immediately into the church in heaven. We outlive. We've got a glorious hope. Death is not the end for the believer. And they outloved them. The love of the believers, their family life, their social life. They were so loving and so kind. And people said, they are in on a good thing. You see, part of the problem is we've got a great product, but it's badly marketed. We have the greatest product in the world. This glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if we're going to market it, we have to live it and convince people by our lifestyle that Jesus is Redeemer. And best of all, lo, I am with you always to the end of the world. It's all about Jesus. All about Jesus. And what he did for us in his death and resurrection and ascension in the Father's right hand, was in order to build a community of believers. And ah, what do we do? Rejoice. Rejoice in the glories of Jesus Christ. And then do what he says. Talk about me. Talk about what I've done. Talk about what I have to offer. And bring them to faith. And then into the fellowship of the church to be cared for, to be nurtured, and to grow in Christ-likeness. Marvelous. Don't you think? Marvelous plan. What about Calvary? What is it to do in the future? 
celebrate. Celebrate Jesus Christ and tell the good news and bring people into the fellowship to be nurtured and cared to serve the world and to know that we must become like Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that in the scriptures you've given us everything. And we thank you at this anniversary time as we look forward to the future. You've given us such a wonderful plan. And we pray that each one of us, if we have not yet already received the gift of God's forgiveness, will receive the Lord Jesus as Savior and that we will bear our witness by word and by mouth and grow to be more like Jesus Christ. Amen. I told you I'd forget something. There's one thing I want to tell you. When I went to Cardiff as a student, um, I very soon learned about a marvelous pastor who had lived in the city in the central Baptist church downtown, Charles Davis. He was a very Christ-like person. And the story is told that the pastor went to knock to visit one of family in the church. And the little boy went to the door. And when he saw the pastor, he left the door wide open and he went into the kitchen in Welsh. And he said, Ma'am, Jesus Christ is at the door. <laughs> That's what we are to be. Jesus Christ at the door of human need. Thank you for listening. God bless you.